from the city of Chicago, a city most recently known for its crime and violence. On this podcast, we will be sharing stories of redemption from individuals raised in the tough streets of Chicago and from around the country. Some of them were gang members, drug dealers, incarcerated, victims, and perpetrators of violence. Listen to my guests as they share their experiences, struggles, trauma, but also the strength, hope, faith, and perseverance these have developed in them to keep pushing and moving forward in life. Tune in to hear how their lives have gone from darkness to light and from wrong to strong. To another episode of Wrong to Strong Chicago, I'm your host. My name is Omar Calvillo, and uh, today we're going to be doing something different on uh, on this podcast. Usually I, I have people come on this podcast and I interview them. I ask them questions about what it was like growing up in Chicago, but uh, me and my wife were talking recently, and she was telling me, man, I think you should share your story on here one day. So, you know, we discussed it, and, you know, we had the idea of having her interview me today. So I would like to welcome my wife, Anne Calvillo. Welcome to the Wrong to Strong Chicago podcast. Thank you for having me, babe. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be able to interview you. Um, I've always said that your testimony is my favorite testimony, just because I've gotten to see firsthand what God has done in your life. Oh, thank you for sharing that. But yeah, so basically, so what I'm going to do, basically, I'm going to be the, the guest on here today. Yeah. And I'm going to hand this over to her, and she's going to be asking the questions, and <laughs> I'm all yours. All right, all right. So um, I know basically on Wrong to Strong, we talk a lot about um, just growing up in the city of Chicago. So tell us a little bit of what that's been like for you growing up in the city of Chicago. Okay, yeah, well, I was uh, born and raised here in Chicago. Um, uh, I grew up my whole life, well, not my whole life, the first 13 years of my life. Uh, I spent growing up in Pilsen. I grew up on 22nd and Hoyne. Um, the address, I still remember my address, 2048 was 22nd place, you know. And back then, to be honest, it was a, a it was a beautiful place uh, for me to grow up. We lived in a three-story building, and it was all family. Uh, you know, me, I had my parents. You know, my mom and dad were always in, in the picture, so it was us. Uh, and back then, it was only just me and my two brothers. I had an older brother and a younger brother. And uh, we lived on the first floor. Uh, up on the second floor was my uncle, my aunt, and they had a, a bunch of children, my cousins. You know, I forget how many there was, maybe like eight. And then downstairs was my aunt and my uncle. I had my two cousins down there as well. So uh, growing up in Pilsen for me was like family. I remember even like neighbors that lived down the block. They were like family members to us. It was very like a close-knit community for me. Um Man, I, I, now that I think about it, it's like, I felt like safe, protected. You know, I had big cousins, uncles, and it was it was a, a very special, I had very special memories of growing up in Pilsen, uh, just on that block. Um, all the family, uh, I want to send a shout out to the families that I remember, you know, of course, my own, the Calvillo, Benitez, uh, Perez family. Then we had like neighbors that we grew up with that were, in, that were like family there's the Obonse family, Ramirez, and there's so many more, you know, that, so I'll say as far as, like, the area I remember, Pilsen, uh, right on the corner was, like, a hot dog place. I remember in the summer, uh, right when they were getting ready to close down, you know, they would give us hot dogs and whatever food they had left over. Uh, I lived right across the street from a Catholic church, beautiful church, you know, it's uh, St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. uh, man, just, uh, it was nice. It was a, uh, for me, like my childhood there, I remember it as good. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is family, always gathering with them, and it, it, it was nice. Yeah, and so being in that tight-knit community, um, it's all about family. And I know that your family is just a, a very, has a very close bond with one another. Um, tell us what that was like as far as like what was going on within the four walls of your home? What did your family structure look like? Yeah, you know, we, we had a big family. Our family structure was, man, one thing I would say about my dad to start off with, he was hardworking. Uh, since, ever since I was, I was little, I remember he had his full-time job. 
he'll go to work and then he'll come home and do work. He was like the neighborhood of me uh, mechanic. He'll be working on people's cars where it'd be in the evenings and for sure on the weekends. I remember him having uh, having us help him, you know, me and my brothers in the garage. We'll be over there passing him the tools, holding the life room. So, you know, um, since an early age, he, he, he uh, taught, I'll say all of us, a hard work ethic. Uh, which I believe I still have to this day. Uh, as far as inside the home, like my whole family, I love my family. Uh, but man, I grew up in a culture, I think, you know, as, as a Mexican culture, the drinking. You know, it was always drinking, even, you know, the, the, the weekdays and the weekends, forget about it. Man, it was always like party time, whether it be there where we lived or we always used to go by my uncle's house, whether it be um, southeast side by Calumet Park, I had an uncle. And just it was always family parties. I remember, uh, oh, but that that was like I'll say the main staple was drinking, and be, obviously with drinking, a lot of stuff comes with that. Uh, there was a lot of arguing inside my house. You know, I remember as an early age, um, back then my dad used to drink more. You know, so I remember like driving home from parties where he'd be like swerving on the expressway, and we'd be scared coming home. Uh, just things like that, I would say. So inside the the home, you know, like I said, I had my, my mom and dad there, but there was definitely, you know, some, you know, struggles, I guess. Like you, you have a young couple, I'm sure they had a lot on their plate, you know, pressure, trying to provide for us. Uh, but yeah, there was some arguing, drinking. So I grew up in a family that, that like, like till this day, they have like, they talk about who was able to drink the most. You know, like, man, who was able to uh, hold down their liquor? Who who was the last man uh, sitting on the table? And that was, it was that type of culture, you know? And that's how I grew up. You know, I grew up where, you know, giving uh, giving a young kid beer and ha watching him drink, it was fun. It was cool, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it was that, that type of environment. I love my family. We're very close. But there were certainly, you know, certain things I wish, you know, were a little different, I guess. So, um, I hear you say that you grew up in this loving home, loving environment. Yes, your family um, had issues, right? And just like you mentioned, um, it's very typical in our culture um, to just view drinking as not alcoholism, which is what it is, but back then it's kind of like, it's what you do, it's what we do, right? Um, so how did that affect you personally growing up in that um, type of mindset where this is normal. This is normal for me. This is what, you know, I grew up in. And so how did this affect you in your life? Well, I guess I guess when I was young, I didn't realize how, we, how it was affecting me. I say it wasn't until I started getting older. So back then, you know, it was cool to, you know, be with my cousins and uncles. And here we are young and we were drinking. They wouldn't say no, go in the cooler, grab a beer, smoke a cigarette, even though I probably didn't know how to do it right. It was just something about, you know. <laughs> Something about being with the older guys, whether it be my family members, family friends, and, mm -hmm. you know, just being able to be one of the guys, you know. Ever yeah. since I was young, I wanted to be one of the guys, belong. Oh, you know, when you're young, you want to grow up quick. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the little kid, you know. Right. You, you want to feel like, man, you know, I, I can hang with the big guy. So I will say back then, I didn't see how it was affecting me, but I will say later on, as, as I guess as we get into my story, the drinking wasn't enough no more. Mm -hmm. It led me to do other things, so. Yeah. And so with that, you know, the other things, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I would say like um, uh, growing up in Pilsen uh, with my friends, you know, you know, you, I always admired, you know, let's say like, uh, um, you know, like the, the, the gang lifestyle, you know, I, I would look up and... Um, I would look up to and admire those that were in the gangs, you know, those that were in my neighborhood. Uh, just, they, they, they were cool in my eyes, you know, they were like, uh, man, I, I used to dress like them even as a, a young age. And I don't know, just something about that lifestyle that, that attracted me. So I would say what that led me to do, even, you know, let me start experimenting with drugs, like you could say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was weed in the beginning and then from that, maybe, uh, started doing like cocaine and then other things as I started getting more involved. Hmm. And so you started doing drugs, you started admiring the gangs. 
Um, and then growing up in Pilsen, you know, we know that that neighborhood is pretty much known uh, for, for the gangs. Uh, tell us what it looked like once you started wanting to be a part of those gangs and, and why. Hmm. I, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to share uh, this story here. Uh, I always admired, you know, the, the, the gangs, and I had my cousin. His name was Gil. Uh, he was he, he was part of the gang in the neighborhood, and he was a young, tough guy. Like, he had a, a reputation, you know. Uh, I remember being young, you know, just, you know, being just little guys in the neighborhood. And, like, if we were ever, like, if, let's say if some other gang members tried to mess with us, because we weren't, we weren't plugged yet, you know. We were, we were young. But we were, you know, having our own little crews or stuff in the neighborhood. I remember back then it was very popular to have like little party crews. Mm -hmm. You know, you started making your own little, you know, little names here. You had a party crew on this block and some down the block. So I would say back then it was more like a little party crew, just guys getting together, you know, maybe tagging. We used to do some tagging, you know, writing, you know, in garages or walls or whatever. So that that's what I started doing. But as far as gangs, like uh, my cousin would keep us from joining the gang. You know, cause uh, I remember like I, I would jump on my bike, and I would go like to to look for him, cause he he'd be you know a few blocks down, you know, hanging out with his guys, and I'll go over there and just cause I always admired him, and I'll go over there trying to hang out with him. Be like, man, he'll he'll kick me out, you know. I told me go back to, you know, where 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 my you know little group of friends were at. So I would say that even though I admired that, he he was the one that would that would keep me. Uh, my younger brother and my my cousin, you know, from from that lifestyle. Like, if we ever got in trouble, like let's say some gang members tried to mess with us, all we had to do, hey man, my my cousins, you know, and I would say his nickname, and they were like, oh man, you know, hey, it's cool, and they would leave us alone. Mm -hmm. It was almost like his name, uh, his uh, reputation, I guess, uh, was like our protection. Yeah. You know, like you know, the guys in the neighborhood would leave us alone. Oh man, that's your cousin. All right, cool. You know, we're you're all right. You know, we ain't gonna mess with you. So. Yeah. I believe he 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 played a role in uh, in, in at at that point in time of keeping us from uh, joining joining him in his footsteps. Yeah, and so you talk about your cousin Gil and how he plays this role of this protector, wanting to keep you guys kind of out of that lifestyle that he was already in. What happened? And I guess, why did that all change? And how did you get started in the gang life? Um, well, I, I will say what happened. It was uh, August 19, 2004. Uh, I remember, um, uh, well, I lived in Pilsen up to the age of 13. We ended up moving by um, Gage Park neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were living there and I remember we still would go back to our neighborhood though, because all my friends were there. I didn't know nobody in Gage Park. I didn't even want to hang out over there. So we would always go back, go back to Pilsen. So on this night, it was uh, August 19, uh, 2004. I remember we're on Western. I think my mom was driving us back to the neighborhood and I seen my cousin. He used to live on 47th and Western. I sit, uh, I seen him sitting in his front steps and something told me that, man, we, maybe we should give him a ride. But I seen him there and, I, you know, my mom, we just kept going. We went to the neighborhood and I forget what it was, maybe a Friday night. I'm not sure, to be honest, I don't remember. But, you know, we went to the neighborhood hanging out and I believe we went back home later. And then uh, basically that night uh, we got a call and saying that uh, that my cousin Gil had gotten shot. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so we get the news that he got a shot and it was, I believe it was early in the morning, early in, in, in the morning. And uh, I, I, do, I do think it was like a Saturday morning. Well, anyways, we get the news he got shot and uh, it, it turns out that he had gotten shot by, by the police. So basically the police killed him. It happened on 19th at Hoyne and he, 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 he was young, you know? So that was, to me, that was like the first like tragedy that I experienced growing up. I have lost like family members, but they were old, you know, it was never somebody that was my age. My cousin was about a year or two older than me. Uh, we grew up together, you know, he lived in Pilsen too, like a few a few blocks away. We were always together, you know, uh, him, his brother, you know, me and my brothers, and my, another one of our cousins. You know, like I said, it was a tight knit family that we grew up in. 
And man, that really hurt. That really hurt. And uh, losing them, um, you know, it just, it's, you know, because you, you, you heard stories back then about how he passed, mm -hmm. you know, and it made you angry. You know, it, it made me and my family, my, my, I would say my cousins, it was like a hatred for the police, to be honest, if I'm being honest right now. Uh, hatred for people in a, a, a authority in general. And I believe that's what started the, the rebellion in us. Um, like he was like the buffer, I guess, that kept us, uh, you know, from, from, from the gang life. Yeah. So that was a major hurt in our family. And, and I think what hurt the most too, that was part of it, of course, losing them. But I remember going to my aunt's house, you know, a few days, maybe a week later. And, you know, just helping her, you know, like, you know, just being there for her. And uh, we were helping her, I think, pack some stuff up. And she was receiving letters in the mail. Uh, people were writing her. But mm. these weren't, like, support letters. These were la letters of hate. Mm. And she, she she, didn't know how to read English. She, she would ask me to, if I could open them and read them. So I would read them. And these were very hateful letters that... You know, the stuff that we're saying, almost like, we're glad he's gone. We're glad that happened to him. Uh, very racist and hateful letters. And that even just made me, like, more angry. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know. It just, like, fueled, I will say, like a fire. And um, so, yeah, that happened. We lost him. The whole family grieved. And it, it was a huge loss. It was a huge hurt for our family. Um, and that, um, I think that opened up the road for uh, for my, my uh, the first one to uh, join the gang afterwards I think it was maybe about uh, some months or a year later was my younger brother mm -hmm. about two years younger he he was the first one that turned out you know I would say he was probably like the craziest one out of all of us to be honest <laughs> even though he was younger mm -hmm. uh, he was man he was just tough he was a tough guy you know he turned out and uh, soon after I would say me my other cousin and maybe some friends followed so and like I said, it was just fueled by hurt, hate, anger, and yeah, it ended up, you know, to turning out what what where, where he what basically where he I think if he were still there, probably would have kept us from following in his footsteps. Mm. I think you mentioned something um, really important there because I know that most of the guys in the hood turn out because they're looking for family, they're looking for acceptance. They're looking for love, which are all the things that you already had. You already had growing up. You had that close, tight-knit family. You had that love. You had that um, support people there in your corner. Um, so you saying that you turning out had a lot to do with the your hurt, the hate that you had in your heart for what happened to your cousin and, and, and how it happened. Um, you, you said it fueled like this rebellion in you to turn to the gangs, to turn to the streets, the very place that your cousin was trying to protect you from. But now you found yourself um, involved now uh, with the streets and with the gangs. Tell me what was going on in your, I guess, in your mind while this was all happening. And like, what, what did it cause you to do? Once, you know, your your cousin has passed, you've seen your aunt's grief, you got these letters. What did you do from there? Uh, I think what I did was uh, me, me, and my, me and my younger brother were re really close. You know, I got an older brother. Um, but me and my younger brother were like twins, always together. So once like he, he turned out, you know, once he joined, it's like, like, I, to be honest, like, I joined almost, like, to, you know, to be with him, just, you know. And honestly, we were already, like, in the neighborhood we grew up in. You know, you're already you're already out there, you know, making connections, doing crazy stuff. Maybe not gangbanging, but drinking, like I said, tagging and doing all this stuff, partying, uh, doing drugs. So, and then, you know, you start, even though, like, let's say, like, it, I think I maybe joined, like, a year after my brother, something like that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't immediate. And, uh, yeah, well, I guess what it led to is just, you know, being in the neighborhood, I was already hanging out with these guys, you know, like doing stuff with them. So when it was like time for me, I guess, to like officially join, basically I got almost like blessed in, 
I remember it was me and two other guys that turned out like on that one particular day, and the two other guys ended up getting like like violated, like like beat down, and uh, they made an exception because I was already out there with all these guys. You know, I, mm -hmm. I knew all of them were already hanging out. It was almost like I was uh, in it, but not in it. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yeah. So I would say what it led me to do, man, I was I was lost to be honest. I was started doing like a lot of drugs, uh, weed, cocaine. Back then, man, we started acid. Uh, PCP, you know, a, a, they call it a wiki water, uh, dunk square, smoking that, and that was just bad. I would say I was in a in a place where I was lost and just out there. Um, you mentioned about, I know a lot of guys join because they don't have that that family. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they go there to find family. Well, I went there because my family was in it too, though. You know, I had my younger brother, my other cousin. Mm. And some other cousins, too, they were hanging out with us. So it, it, it's almost like the whole family went in. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. So yeah. it was still a family affair. Yeah. And so now your family's in. You're into the, the whole gang life. Um, you're obviously out there. You know, you said you got blessed, and which, from my understanding, is kind of like you didn't have to go through the whole violation part. Um, you got you got blessed in through family, having family in there. Tell me when it was that you found yourself making decisions that you knew were going to have consequences. Well, I, I think once you're in that lifestyle, it starts off with little things you do, whether it be stealing, robbing, um, stealing cars, you know, um, just things like that that we you know, and, and other stuff we were doing, you know, as, as far as like the street life goes, you're always, you know, you're fighting, you know, there's guys that maybe, uh, I know uh, they, you call it the other side that you don't get along with. And, you know, there's, there's, um, yeah, just fights, I would say, you know, like things like that. So what was your question? <laughs> I lost you. <laughs> Guys. Yeah. So my question is, when did you start making choices oh, okay, yeah, that yeah. had consequences? Oh, yeah. I would say ever since I was born. I made choices that had consequences, <laughs> right? I mean, a, a, every a, a, anything that we do is going to have a consequence. So it's going to be a reaction. But yeah, mm -hmm. as far as that goes, um, it, it made it easy. I guess, you know, doing the drugs and all that, you're not in the right state of mind. So it makes it easier for you to do stuff, you know, you shouldn't be doing. You know you're going to get in trouble, but you're not in the right state of mind. So, yeah, you know, out there wild. Uh, back then, I wasn't the fine physical specimen that you see right before your eyes, you know. <laughs> I, 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 was, <laughs> I like how she laughed. You know, I, I was the, the scrawny I guy. I have to but, agree. Yeah. I have to agree. <laughs> no, but back then, uh, w w w you know, the reason I say that is back then I was scrawny. I, w I wasn't like a tough guy. You know, I, I knew guys that I hung around with. These guys uh -huh. were big. These guys were tough. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I was a little, like a puny guy, a little, you know, weakling. So what that led me to do was to to pick up a gun, you know, mm -hmm. to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I was a tough guy out there, but it, it I, I became, I would say, trigger happy. Mm -hmm. they, they would have us, uh, you know, when you're young, they'll put you on security in the neighborhood. And to me, that was something that I liked doing. And I seen it like, a man, I'm protecting my friends. I'm mm -hmm. protecting my family that are out here. Yeah. You know, if anybody comes and tries to hurt them, you know, I, I'm going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. So I think... That's one of the choices that uh, I ended up doing, just being out there. And, you know, there were, you know, a lot of guys where we're doing that, you know, we would take turns. But that's one of the things that led us to do. But, yeah, we were, you know, running, in, uh, you know, stores, just robbing, you know, robbing the store and running out with stuff. So, yeah, yeah. So it was a little bit of everything, to be honest. Right. So you're making all these choices. You you chose now to protect yourself by picking up a gun. And how old were you about this time? I had to be like 15, 16. Let's say, yeah, let's say like 16 or 16 or 17, somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this. You're running around in the streets, 15, 16 years old uh, with a gun doing, you know, all kinds of crazy things. Uh, what did your family try to do? Like, what intervention did they try to do to kind of stop what was happening with you and your brother? Um, I, I would say, uh, well, of course, my mom, she would always tell us not to go over there to the neighborhood, but we're young, you know, like, we're going to go no matter what. 
Of course, my family didn't approve, you know. And of course, we would lie about the things we were doing. Oh, you know, we're just going to go by my cousin's house because he lived in the neighborhood. We didn't. So that was our way to get over there. Hey, we're just going to be by his house. And that was, we would land there and then, you know, go hang out. Yeah. Uh, my dad, you know, he worked uh, second shift for uh, during that, that time that we were out there. So I think that made it easier for us to go to the streets. Yeah. Because to be honest, he wasn't around at night. Okay. And sometimes he'll be working really late. And sometimes I believe he'll get out like at two, three in the morning. He'll go to the neighborhood and find us mm. and grab us. So With that belt? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, there was a few instances <laughs> with the belt, even though we were teenagers and we thought we were men, you know. Yeah. Uh, my dad let us know that, hey, you know. But yeah, he, he, he will go out there. And I think, you know, he... He did. He did what he had to. What he had to do, as far as like working to provide yeah. for my family. That's one thing I'll always remember. He worked hard, but I think that made it easier for us to go to the neighborhood. The fact that he was working late. Yeah. But yeah, he. They, our family definitely tried to discourage us. I had other family tell us, "Man, you know, don't be in that lifestyle." So you you would hear from a lot of people, teachers, yeah. you know, people that are like, "Man, hey, you, you guys are good kids. You know, don't don't go down that road." But you know, when you're young, you, you know it all. Can't nobody tell you anything, you know. Um, and like I said, we were in a rebellion. You know, we had anger. We were hurt. And we, you, when you're hurt, I think you just want to hurt others, I guess. Tell me about that time because, you know, I know your story. I know your testimony. Tell, me, tell us about that time when your mom was really worried about you. And she said, you know what, I'm going to send you to Mexico. Tell me what happened. Okay, well, I guess what ended up happening, um, they, they, back then, I was, like I said, I was really, really skinny, look, looking real frail, and they sent me to Mexico to go see a curandera, you know, so, because they said somebody had done some, uh, you know, like, so, uh, some voodoo or, you know, black magic, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it had nothing to do with all the drugs I was doing, you know, and all the drinking, you know, that had no, no, nothing to do with it. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, I ended up going to, to Mexico to go see this lady. And I remember being over there with my aunt. We went to Salvatierra and we're walking around the town and we ended up bumping into uh, like my cousin's aunt. She's not my aunt, but she's my cousin's aunt on his family side. And I knew her from uh, Chicago. She used to live over here. Her name was Ch uh, Chata. Uh, so we bumped into her. She invited us to her home, me and my aunt. We went over there for like for lunch, I believe. So we ate some lunch, you know, we're just, you know, talking. And and then as we, when we finished eating, she asked me, hey, Omar, you know, could you come to the back of my house? You know, this was in, in you know, over in Salvatierra. So I go to the back of our house and uh, she had like a, I guess like a makeshift church back there, like a home mm -hmm. church, I guess you could mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. So she asked me, hey, Omar, could we pray for you? So at this point, I'm like, man, I didn't come to Mexico to have somebody pray for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, but, you know, you, you're real respectful, you know, of yeah. people. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? So I remember uh, her and there was another lady and a guy. I didn't know who they were. Now I know because I talked to her after afterwards, but it was like mm -hmm. a pastor and his wife. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, I get there and then they, you know, they surround me. They start praying for me. And what, what freaked me out is like, I guess as they were praying, a couple of them started like speaking in tongues, like in unknown languages, I will say. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, man, what's what, what are they doing? You know, I'm like, yeah. so anyways, I'm there. And then the lady that was there starts speaking over my life, telling me stuff She's like, man, you, you need you need to mend that relationship with your brother. I hear the Lord say that you need to mend that relationship with your brother. And at that point, man, she got my attention because mm. I have my older brother. And at this point, we hadn't talked like for a couple of years, even though we lived in the same house. I wouldn't say a word to him. He wouldn't say a word to me. And there's a, you know, I guess we each had our own reasons for that, whatever that was back then, you know, childish uh, mm -hmm. resentment or anger towards each other, whatever that might have been. But yeah, she's like, man, you need to mend that relationship. She just kept praying and they started saying some stuff over me and that was it. But I know, I'm like, man, I just thought about it. And mm -hmm. and yeah, that's that was that part. And uh, I remember like afterwards, uh, it was that night we ended up going to go see that uh, that curandera lady, 
So, you know, she, we went there, she lit some candles. I had to give her a picture. She said, oh yeah, somebody did something to you. Well, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of it. I'm like, all right. I remember going home that night, you know, to, to my aunt's house and uh, falling asleep. And I remember in the middle of the night, I just felt like my body get all stiff. Like literally, like I was laying there, I just felt my body stiffen out. And I just started feeling hands rubbing my body mm. from my head all the way down. And I just remember letting it like a hissing sound. Mm. And that freaked me out. I had never experienced anything like that, but yeah, that's, that's what happened. And that one instance when I went to Mexico. Mm. So you have this experience. I mean, it, it had to, it had to bring questions to your mind, right? Like, you go to Mexico, you, you're going to get healed from this witch doctor, um, is what a curandera is. Um, and you have this encounter with your aunt, right? Or your cousin's aunt, and she's praying for you, and she's speaking over your life. You come back home to the States, right? You come back home, and what happens next? Uh, at this point, um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Before this had happened, uh, me, me and my younger brother had gotten uh, locked up. Uh, it's a long story behind that, but he ended up getting uh, locked up before me. And uh, that, that, that that really hurt, you know. The, the whole situation hurt me. The circumstances behind it, uh, what led him to to go in there. And, man, I, I, I was lost because we were, we were like twins. We were together all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he was in the juvenile cause he was a juvenile. So he went in and I was out here and, um, I was, uh, you know, I was fighting the, 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 that case. And I remember when they, so what ended up happening when I came back a couple of months later, I ended up getting locked up myself. I basically uh, accepted a plea for, uh, it was the, the first plea offer they gave me. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I'm looking back. I think, you know, I could have probably got less time. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened, they offered me seven years. That was the first thing. And right away, I took it. Mm. I don't know why. I just said, yeah, I'll do it. So mm. they, they gave me seven years. Uh, so when they give you seven back then, it was still 50%. So I had I had to do three and a half years. How old were you at this time? This was, I think I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 18. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, you know what? They gave me seven years, so... Yeah, I ended up going, I got locked up uh, February 4th of 1997. I went in. I went into Cook County. Then from Cook County, I went to Joliet. I think I was in Joliet. I forget. It's, it's like receiving. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was there for maybe, oh, let's say a month, I think. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I got shipped to uh, Vandalia, where I started uh, serving my time. So, yeah, that's, that's what ended up happening. I went in there. And uh, in Vandalia, uh, even throughout the county, when I first got there, there was guys like on the deck that they put me on. They were like, not from my neighborhood, but from an, an, another, a few blocks down. So like everywhere I went, like I knew somebody, which made it easier for me, I would say. Uh, so even back then, I believe God had his hand on me. He protected me because wherever I was at, like I knew somebody, you know, or somebody from the neighborhood or even in Joliet, I bumped into guys from, from the neighborhood whether they were from my gang or from other gangs that I knew, but that I knew from, from the streets. Yeah. And I think that made it easy. So and like when I went to Vandalia, it was like open dorms. Mm -hmm. So there was like a bunch of guys, picture a bunch of guys in just one room, a bunch of bunk beds. Uh, so yeah, man, I went down there and I remember I started working in the kitchen. So I was able to, to bulk up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Um, I went in there 127 pounds, and when I got out, I was like 185, so I gained over 40 some pounds. So, yeah, in the kitchen, um, I, I met a lot of. It's, it's, this may sound crazy, but a lot, I met a lot of like great people that I ended up becoming friends with uh, in there. And it's almost like you go to war together, you build a bond. I don't know, it's weird, mm -hmm. but uh, a, a lot of guys that I met there. So I went to Vandalia, then East Moline. And then from East Moline, I got caught getting a tattoo. Mm -hmm. So then from there, they uh, they shipped me to uh, Danville. I went to Danville, but yeah, that that's that was my experience as far as that goes. But mm -hmm. I, I will share this: like, no, no matter where I was at, whether it was the county, Joliet, 
uh, Vandalia, East Moline. I was always around people. Mm-hmm. So it, it made it easy for me to almost feel like I'm not locked up because I'm interacting with them. Mm-hmm. Whether it was, man, whether it was we're working out, whether it be on the yard, we're working out in the gym, playing basketball, playing handball. You know, you, you build a connection with, with a lot of these guys. You know, you're always interacting. So the weird part is I was already, I think, like two two years plus in there when I got caught getting the tattoo. And they th- throw you in seg, which is basically jail inside a jail, mm-hmm. which is like solitary, I guess you could say, because you're by yourself now in a cell. Okay. And to be honest, like all, all those two years plus, I, I felt like I was keeping it together emotionally. Mm-hmm. I was getting like, you know, because you, you, you got to be strong in there. You got to be tough. You can't show weakness. You can't be in there. Man, I feel sad. I feel like crying. So, man, you, like uh, almost like I was hardened, you know, hardened. Like I hardened myself, hardened my heart. And yeah. just your mentality. Uh, so when they threw me in there, like in, uh, in, 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 seg, in segregation, it's like I'm by myself now. So I'm in there one week, and then two weeks. And then in the second week, it finally hit me. Mm. Like, man, I'm locked up. You know, the Bible says that it is not good for man to be alone. Mm. And at that point, like, it hit me. Like, man, you're locked up. Yeah. And it's funny just from being separated from, you know, the people. Yeah. Or from the guys you're out there just, you know, talking with, you know, working out with and whatever. And I broke down. I remember breaking down. I remember I started writing. And, man, I wrote, like, some poem, you could say, slash prayers while I was in there. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah, it finally hit me, man. Locked up, and then from there, I think I spent like a month there, and then they sent me to Danville, where I finished all my my time. So, so I, all, all together, I did three years, because mm-hmm. uh, they give you back then they give you a, a good time. Mm-hmm. So I had gotten a six months good time. So I ended up yeah doing three years. So you did three years, um, the age of eighteen. So you spent, you know, three years of your young teenage life in there. Um, what was it like to come back to life, like to come back to your neighborhood, your family? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I remember when, when I got out and I came home, like my, uh, you know, my parents, my mom and dad and coming to my house and the house seemed so small. I don't know why it seemed so small. And it was it took some adjusting to to be honest, like you, you, you don't realize the, the effects that that had on you until later on, even till now. Mm-hmm. Like when I reflect back and think about certain things, it, it, it does have an effect. Like I believe it made me uh, more cold. I, I think um, in there I learned my way of coping is to tune out from the situation. Mm-hmm. Like I remember I would be like in the yard sitting on the bench and I would zone out. I would imagine myself like uh, just somewhere else, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm not here. I'm not locked up. And I, like daydreaming, I guess, to yeah. put it simply. Yeah. And that was my way of coping, just, you know, daydreaming. I remember in East Moline, they had a, um, a what do you call it, a, a, a auto shop, which is basically like school. Uh-huh. So they had cars down there. You know, they teach you uh, how to, you know, like how to work on cars. Mm-hmm. And so I'm down there and and I took the class, but you know what I would do sometimes? They had cars, I would just open the door, sit in there, and this just dra- daydream that I'm cruising. Mm. That I'm cruising the neighborhood or, man, just sitting there. Just, you know, like, for real, uh, like, using my imagination to escape the reality of where I was at. Yeah. And, man, it's things like that that, like, I, I would always escape reality. There was no emotions. I remember my family, when they would go visit me, and I seen them, you know, we're in the visiting room talking, and they would leave. It never failed every time I got a huge headache mm-hmm. when they left. Once I got it back to my room. And now I think I used to get those huge headaches because I was like suppressing my emotions, if I'm being honest. Yeah. yeah. Like, because it hurt, you know, to see them, you know, come see you and then they leave. And I would always get headaches. Like, man, why do I always get a headache? Yeah. And back then I didn't know why but now I think it was man I'm suppressing my emotions so yeah coming home you know it it took some some uh, readjusting you know to certain things Uh, I remember I got out in February and in March I had gotten a job you know a month later my my younger brother got me a job and I remember I started working on a Wednesday I worked Wednesday 
Thursday, Friday. I was only making nine dollars an hour, mm -hmm. but it was legit. You know, it's like yeah. you know, I, I was out on parole too. I, I, I got to say that. So when you're out on parole, basically, if you get into any more trouble, they could send you back to finish the rest of your time, mm -hmm. which would have been the complete seven years. So if I would have got you know in some more trouble, I could end up going back. So I was trying to to be good, but yet still messing around, still going to the neighborhood. Um, but yeah, I was just trying to 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 be good but i remember what ended up happening so i, I worked them three days and that friday night i believe back then people still had beepers mm -hmm. pagers this was 2000 <laughs> yeah. I, I think i don't think like cell phones were no you you had a pager yeah, i remember yeah yeah, yeah right I remember okay we, yeah, cool, we had cool. pagers so yeah so i remember it was a friday night you know i was out a month and i'm paging everybody it was 10 11 12 o'clock at night and nobody was calling me i was at home I was mad, like, mm -hmm. it's a Friday night, what the heck am I doing at home? Mm -hmm. You know, I should be out, you know, having a good time. So finally, I think it was my cousin responded. He came and got me, like, it was a past midnight. We ended up going to a party in the neighborhood. So we're at this party, and it's me, you know, the guys from our neighborhood, and there was guys from, uh, like, a couple blocks down, same gang. And we're drinking, you know, I'm, I'm drinking out of a, a Kool-Aid pitcher. Mm -hmm. We had a kegger, and I'm just guzzling you know guzzling beer you drinking uh so long story short i see my brother getting ready to fight with somebody i seen him mm -hmm. arguing with somebody so i'm just watching him and sure enough here he goes swinging on the guy mm -hmm. so as soon as i put my little picture down i went over there to swing myself to hit the guy mm -hmm. and one of my friends was drinking out of a glass cup mm -hmm. and threw it at the guy and it just so happened that as i was going to hit him that glass hit my hand Oh. before it hit the guy yeah and then i went back to swing again and the same thing happened another guy had a glass and threw it at the guy and hit my hand oh my god so what are the odds of that so i don't know if they could see but yeah. like 40 stitches later what ended up happening i had a bunch of cuts in my hand uh, i had cut some arteries some tendons I remember going to the bathroom to wash my hand, and I'm like, man, I was so drunk that I couldn't feel the pain. Anyways, they took me to Cook County, and man, yeah, they ended up, you know, fixing it, and later on I had to have surgery. But what that led to was me falling into a big depression. Mm. I got really depressed. Because I'm like, man, here I am. I had just gotten out. I had just got a job. I just worked three days, and now I can't work. Mm. So I remember, like, going to my neighborhood by myself, Afterwards, you know, after this happened, I had my hand in the cast and I would just walk around with a screwdriver in my pocket. Mm. And I, I tell people that at this point and even at other points in my life when I was younger, when I was out in the streets, you know, I was like suicidal without wanting to kill myself. And I explained it in this sense that I will put myself in situations where I could get myself hurt, but I wasn't going to do it myself. Like I, I had no hope. For a future, I didn't see anything good coming out of my life. I just figured, man, it'd be better if I were dead. So yeah, you know, here I am, just got out, and I'm walking in my neighborhood, uh, knowing knowing well that I I'm right-handed. So if anybody were to jump out at me as I'm out there by myself, I would have really technically been able to defend myself, mm. you know. So I was out there just basically looking to get hurt, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, man. Through God's grace, I believe He He protected me. You know, even in that mindset that I had. Yeah. You know, not 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 you know not looking forward to anything. So, you know, I'm I'm listening to you, and you're telling us about how you know you came out, and it just seems like things were getting worse for you. Uh, you got a job, which was good, but then you go out, you get drunk, um, you end up injuring your hand, and uh, requiring surgery on it you're depressed you're basically like you said suicidal without being suicidal um you're out there in the streets uh what happens i guess at, at some point right something must have happened um that changed that what started happening to you i would say that you know because when i hurt my hand was in march so I was out there, you know, in the neighborhood, just, you know, like I said, injured, you know, hanging out, you know, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. 
And uh, man, I would say, I think everything changed was on June 1st of 2000. Uh, I was standing on the corner, you know, in the neighborhood, just hanging out. I was drinking a 32 ounce of Corona, hanging out with a couple of buddies. And then I looked across the street and I seen a very fine woman walking down the street. And blonde, blue jeans, white blouse. I'm like, dang. <laughs> You know, I'm looking, I'm looking, and I'm a liking, you know? <laughs> so I remember, I, and just want to say that this that was this woman here. It better be. <laughs> so that was her. So that was the first time I seen her. You know, I was out there. So I remember my buddy, he had a convertible parked in the corner, right? That was his car. So I told him, hey, man, give me, let me use your car. I'm going to jump in your car. I'm going to go holler at this girl. He's like, nah, nah, man. I'm like, come on, man, let me use your car. So... You know, basically, you know, he was hating on me. He didn't want to give me the, the chance because I didn't have no car, you know. So my cousin was there. I jumped in his, you know, his gangster van. So <laughs> but by then, you were already a couple blocks down. So I remember, you know, we drove up and I was hanging out the window. And then I just said, hey, girl, could I holler at you? And you looked at me and like, hey, you know. So <laughs> I jumped out, you know, I started talking to you. And that was the first day we met. So I remember, I think you were getting ready to go clubbing that night with your uh, with your cousin, and but uh, you know we were talking and so hey, let's hang out. Uh, I told you, hey, I got three dollars. What you want to do? I don't know if you remember. Yes, <laughs> your famous one liner. So hey, <laughs> I only had three bucks. Hey, I I, I kept it real and, and hey, <laughs> it only cost me three bucks, and here we are. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, we we ended up uh, hanging out that night. You know, I remember we went cruising and man, we just. I just remember joking, joking around a lot. Me and you, you know, yeah. back and forth, just laughing and ha having a good time. And I believe we made a good connection. And after that, you know, we started, uh, you know, seeing each other more. And um, I'll say, uh, like, uh, feelings started growing for one another. Uh, but um, I, I, I got to share this. I, I didn't want to... Um, uh, the, the way I explain, I don't. I didn't want to be a sucker for love. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't want to share. Like, man, I don't want to say that I, man, I like, say I love this girl, and then she's gonna go and hurt me because I had been hurt in the past mm -hmm. when I was younger. I was in a relationship where my girl wasn't my girl. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a, a tattoo on my back that says "Trust No B." So that was my mentality. Like, mm -hmm. man, I'm not gonna, I'm not give, I'm not gonna give my heart to a woman that easily. So I was guarded even in that. Mm -hmm. So here I am, cold hearted, you know, because, you know, the, the lifestyle of prison and the streets. And here I am guarding my heart like, man, I ain't going to I ain't going to show no I ain't going to show no woman that I love her or tell her that I love her. Right. You know, and I remember we were together. I forget how long. And you had told me that you love me. And I would be like, oh, OK, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's I, it was just, you know, pride. Yeah. Not wanting to put myself out there to get hurt. So I remember I would, when people would ask me, oh, is, that, is that your girlfriend? I'd be like, nah, we're just kicking it, you know, just mm -hmm. so so I wouldn't be, you know, I was guarded because I don't want to be like made to look like a fool if, if you if it turned out you weren't yeah. my girlfriend or my woman, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, to answer your question, that's what happened. I met you and uh, we were both, I would say, lost back then. Yeah. So we had two lost people trying to help one another. Yeah. Uh, we ended up, you know, getting together uh, a few years. Uh, you, you you moved into the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's how I met you. You moved, like, right down the block, you know, from where I was hanging out at. Uh, we would, you know, go by your house and chill. And uh, I, I do got to share this one story. When we were hanging out, this was, you know, after we met, we were together probably a year. I remember it was the summertime. We were hanging out in front of your house. You know, a lot of the guys used to, like, hanging up there because it was, like, uh, some more guys that lived on the second floor from where you lived, and there'd be guys hanging out. Yeah. So I remember we were out there, and that night you had told me, like, to go in. So I remember I went in, and then I'm like, hey, you know what? I ain't going to stay in here. You know, I'm going to go hang out with my friends outside, you know? Like, man, they're hanging out. So yeah. I remember, like, nah, you know, let's just chill. I think it was late already. Like, yeah. Man, let's just chill, watch a movie. Like, nah, I'm going to go hang in the front. So I went to the front. We're hanging out there, and sure enough, I think maybe like five minutes after I went out there, mm -hmm. a car pulls up on us. Yeah. Both windows rolled down, yeah. passenger side and the back seat, and they just started shooting at us. Yeah. I Close remember, range, too. Yeah, it was right there because uh, 
and, and, and that block is only like maybe a car's length from where the like the stairs are at to go yeah. into the houses and it was very close so yeah there was a bunch of guys that just started shooting and uh we all man, I remember diving to the floor everybody dove ran whatever and uh Oh, only one of the guys got got shot. He got shot in the leg. Uh, luckily, he was okay. They took him to the hospital. No, no major damage. But the crazy part is when we went back down to your apartment. Yeah. Uh, her bedroom was right, like in facing her window. Face like even though it was on the basement floor, you could say. Yeah. Uh, when they were shooting, two bullets went right in through the window. Yeah. And right to where her bed was at, where it's basically where me and her would have been sitting. Yeah. So I remember we went back in and we seen the bullet holes right in the bedroom wall. And we're right like, in the wall. yeah. If we would have been, if we would basically, if I would have stayed in there, yeah. we probably got got shot either me or you. So yeah. I always remember that there was always shootings there. Uh, you know, it, it was crazy. It was a crazy neighborhood, and I remember um, a, a friend of ours. Uh, and uh, asked us if we would move into her house. She lived more south. I believe it was on 62nd and killed there, was it? Somewhere over yeah. there, was it? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, we ended up moving out of the neighborhood into a basement apartment. And uh, yeah, that started us on a whole nother trajectory. Yeah. I just have to say, going back um, to, to when we met, you know, I remember you clearly telling me that you were not looking for anything serious that you've been hurt in the past. And it's funny cause that's the same place that I was coming from too. I had just gotten out of a very toxic, um, violent relationship. And so I wasn't looking for another relationship. I wasn't looking for that. And so I felt like that's why we, we it's weird, but we kicked it off so well. Like we, we formed this friendship um yeah. we got along so well you know we formed this friendship and like you said we were lost we were lost it was like the blind leading the blind back yeah. then um but one thing that you know i think that always stood out to me was that you know you were protective of me and even though i was out there in the streets too like just hanging out with my sister with my cousin doing my thing you were just like, hey, you good? You know, always checking out, making sure everything was good. Um, that night when, because we had, a, I think, two drive-bys that I can remember. Yeah. Um, because like I tell you now, I feel like they traumatized me, especially that one. Going back to the apartment and seeing those two bullet holes, I, it, I just couldn't get out of my mind that that could have been us sitting there. We were right there literally before it happened. And I just couldn't get that off my mind. I was I was the one freaking out. I was the one like, yeah, I was just freaking out. Um, and then seeing your friend, you know, I know you, you just say it so calmly. Yeah, my, you know, my friend got shot in the leg. But seeing this guy and his legs bleeding and they put, bring him into the apartment. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that, right? Yeah, they, came they bring yeah. him into the apartment and they're trying to stop the blood. And they're like, well, let's take him to then you put him in a car and you take him this was like something out of a movie for me. It was just happening just so, it was just surreal. Like, is this really happening? And that's the kind of life that I found myself in after like um, being with you, you know? Um, of course I had been in, in other situations prior to, but nothing like this where we were getting shot at just literally a couple feet distance, you know? Um, and my sister was there too. So it, it was, it became a very, um, just dangerous type of lifestyle where even, even though I was out there, you know, um, kind of numbing my pain with alcohol, like this really did something to me, it really traumatized me. So then we end up moving out of Pilsen into, um, our friend's basement, right? And I felt like things, I thought things were going to get better because now we're out of that whole environment. Um, but it didn't. So tell us a little bit about what that looked like once we moved over to uh, 62nd. Yeah, and uh, yeah well, well, we moved out of there. That, that got me out of the neighborhood. So I wasn't directly there, but 
I was still hanging around with the guys, you know, on the weekend, still still going over there. So, yeah, you know, I think it had an effect because I think it's a, there's a difference when you're every day in the neighborhood when when you're only going over on certain days. So there was like a slow detachment. Uh, didn't make me better, you know, still drinking and doing whatever. Uh, but yeah, I would say what ended up happening was I think we were together four years at this point. We we're living there and uh, she, uh, the, um, the friend that uh, we moved in with invited you to church. Mm-hmm. And I remember you're like, hey, I'm going to go to church. And you went and you came back and you were saying, man, I gave my life to the Lord. You know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, good for you. You know, mm-hmm. and I remember telling you, yeah, good for you. You know, I already believe in God. You know, I always used to wear my cross, my rosary. So I'm like, man, hey, you know, you, you, go go ahead. I just, I think I remember telling you, hey, you know, you told me to go with you. And I ain't going to go with you. Like I'm good, you know. I believe in God, and I. But I did tell you this, you know. Just, just, just pray for me. And I think it's probably the worst thing I ask you to do. <laughs> yeah, and um, at that time I was pregnant too. I was pregnant with um, our daughter. I was pregnant with our daughter Angelina, maybe two or three months pregnant, um, and things just gotten worse. I honestly started to see things getting worse. I had hit rock bottom in my life. Um, I just seen a, the cycle kind of repeating itself for me, um, pregnant again, um, just in a relationship that's not a committed relationship. Um, you were doing your thing. I was doing mine, but now I had to slow down because now I'm pregnant. Now I can't numb my pain through alcohol. Now I can't, you know, numb it through cigarettes and everything else I was doing, partying, clubbing, and I believe at that time when she asked me to go, it, it was definitely the Lord calling me and tugging on my heart. And when I went and I surrendered my life to the Lord, um, I thought, I thought when I got home, things are going to be better. Things are going to be great. But I felt that the closer I got to God, the more you, um, you acted out like, man, I felt like you started getting worse. Things started getting yeah. worse in my home. Tell us uh, a little bit about that. I, I will say, well, back then, you know, I asked you to pray for me. And I remember when you kept going to church and praying for me, I started having a lot of demonic nightmares at night. I started having dreams about stuff in my past that I had forgotten about. And it was almost like God was opening up a book and showing me like, man, this this incident and that incident, like, I don't know, it was weird, like showing me what, what things that I was involved with that I had done. So this went on for a few months. Um, and I, yeah, you're right. I started getting worse. Back then, I didn't know about like the spiritual life. I didn't know that there's like a spiritual battle happening because here you are coming with the light of God, the light of Christ into the home. And here I am in darkness. Here I am. You know, uh, like like the gang I was part of, the, the name of it was uh, Satan Disciples. And I remember back then when with when my friends, we, we would always say, I don't even want to say it now, but I have to say it so people understand. We used to say, Amor de Diablo, which is basically like love of the devil. Mm-hmm. And we would always confess it. And back then, I didn't know that the Bible says that the tongue has the power of life and death. And, and that you, you will eat like the fruit, the fruit of whatever words you're speaking. So... Here, we, we, here you are in darkness, uh, living a lifestyle that, that is of the enemy, you know, because the Bible says that the devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what you're involved in. You're confessing his name. You're saying that you love him. And, of course, it, it was more than that. It was more than just the natural. It was the spiritual. Because yeah. I remember even back then, in my younger days, I remember, like, on, on times where I got high and I would try to go to sleep at night, I would actually see, like, devils well, I had my eyes closed and I could see the images of devils like hmm. like they're in the room with me so it was definitely darkness when, when you're when you're in that lifestyle you're in darkness I don't care what the name of your gang is I don't care if you're on the right or the left in the natural you may have a certain name for your gang but in the spiritual they're all ser- serving the same one they're all serving the enemy hmm. you know they're all they're all serving the fallen angel and doing his work so, yeah, there was definitely a spiritual battle going on, I'll say, in our home. 
as you were praying for me. And this went on for a few months. Yeah. And then I remember I got like really bad. One day they had to carry me home, my friends, from coming home out drunk. And I think you, you had had enough, you like, you know, and and at that point, you know, you're like, oh, you know, I think we're going to, you know, there was it was just a bad night, a, a bad few weeks, I'll say. And uh, the thing you're like, oh, and I believe that's the time you called my parents and told yeah. them to come talk to me. And I remember I was mad. Yeah. I was furious. Like, man, I'm 20 some years old. You calling my mom and dad. And then you're, you're telling me that I got to leave the apartment. I'm like, no, you leave. Mm -hmm. I remember back then we were uh, splitting the rent. Uh -huh. I think we we're going halves because uh -huh. we weren't married, you know. Yeah. And they're like, what are you kicking me? You can't kick me. I pay rent here too. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, it was crazy, you know. I think we were getting ready to probably, to, you know, you were getting ready to leave me, you know, mm -hmm. the way I was acting. And I told you, um, I think it was like on a Sunday night, I asked you to pray for me. Yeah. I don't know if you want to share yeah, and so that was the night where um, I called your parents, I packed your clothes, and I put it out, and I was just getting ready to to just um, release you. Um, my prayer was that, you know, God, if, if this man is for me, change him, Lord, and if he's not, um, take him out of my heart, and take him out of my life, because I, I don't want to do this again. I had done it before. I was already a single mom, and I didn't want to do this again. And I said, Lord, I, I can do this with you. I can take care of my children with you, Lord, as long as I have you. And so I I just knew it was time to say goodbye, but you weren't having it. <laughs> you weren't having it. And that night, I remember um, that was a hard night. That was a hard night. But you you said, you know, pray for me. Pray for me. I see the change in you, but pray for me. And I remember just being a couple months in my walk with the Lord, but I remembered um, seeing the women and and the men pray, and they would just put their hands on the person they were praying for, and they would just start praying for them. And that's what I did. I just remember going over to you. You were hungover on the bed, and I just put my hands on you and I started praying for you. And I just remember like, I, I think you started crying. I think you started crying and you were, you told me that you see demons. And I remember praying for that too. And then you said, you know, I'll go to church with you. And at that time, I think we were going twice a week. I was going twice yeah. a week with my friend, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right. And, and Sundays. And and Sundays, yeah. So three times a week. And I remember I said, okay, Tuesday, because it was, yeah, uh, I think, was, Sunday. Yeah. I said, Tuesday, come with me to church. So I remember you said, yeah. And I said, um, I remember calling my mentor Monday morning to let her know that you said, yeah, that you were going to come to church because we, we both had been praying for you. And she was so happy. She was like, praise God, we got to pray and we got to really pray for him. I said, okay. So I remember going to work and um, I was, I did sales and I was in my car and here I am pregnant and driving and I'm praying and I'm crying and I'm crying and I'm just asking God, God, if this man is for me, change him. And if he's not for me, take him out of my life and out of my heart, Lord. And I remember that was Monday. You were still excited to go. I'm going to go. Tuesday comes along and I'm praying and I'm I'm even more excited. And you confirmed with me that morning that, yeah, you're going to go. Well, I'm, I'm coming home and I'm like, let's, you know, getting ready. And then um, I see you and I ask you, you're ready to go. And you're like, nah, you know what? I'm tired. I just got out of work. I'm not going to go, but you go. And I said, but that's not what you said. You said you were going to go. And you were like, nah, nah, I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to go lay down. And I said, all right. So as you went in the shower, I did the only thing that I thought to do in that moment was I, I went in the room and I closed the door in my bedroom and I got on my knees and I just started praying. And I said, God, if he's the one for me, change him, change his heart. And if he's not, take him out of my life. And I remember 
as I'm praying, I hear a knock at the door and then I open it and you're like, come on, let's go. Let's go. And I said, I don't think I've seen a pregnant woman run so fast to grab her coat. <laughs> but I said, let's go. Yeah. You know, what's weird that that day, that Tuesday, I remember driving home from work and a deep, deep sleep hit me like, man, I would say like never before. I was actually falling asleep on the expressway driving home, like a heaviness. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, it was a heaviness and I believe it was a spiritual attack. I believe the enemy wanted me to be so tired, so weary, that just almost like he was trying to put me in the sleep, you know, so I could just stay home. So I believe that was a spiritual attack. But yeah, you praying definitely changed it. We ended up going to church in Chicago, Indiana. I remember I got there, a brother at the door gave me a hug. As soon as I walked in and I, man, I like, this, you know, be hugging on me. You know, for real, my family, we didn't hug. Back then it was all handshakes, you know, and you shake one another's hand, that's about it. And uh, man went in there, you know, the worship, you know, was very, uh, you know, very lively worship. I was, you know, I, was, I wasn't used to that, you know, almost like, uh, what, what would you say? What's the word? Uh, what's the word? How would you describe that? Just type like of worship? spontaneous Spon worship. Spontaneous. Yeah. And clapping. Yeah, you go dancing, yeah. you know. <clears throat> so, yeah, they're, you know, they're worshiping. Pastor starts preaching, sharing the word. Uh, man, the word's hitting me. You know, I feel it on the inside. At the end, he makes an altar call. Uh, who here wants to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And by then, man, just everything, the worship and the, the preaching that he did was already, like, tugging at my heart. So I lift him up my hand. I remember he asked me to come to the front. I think it was me and somebody else. He led, he led me in a, in a sinner's prayer. Uh, basically confessed that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. He had me repeat the prayer after him. Uh, then I remember he put his hand on top of my head. And when he put his hand on top of my head, I just felt like a heat start filling my body, like slowly, like from the top of my head all the way down. And at this moment, I didn't know, I didn't know what was happening to me. Like, I didn't know anything about the Bible or anything about the Holy Spirit, nothing. So I'm just up there. And I remember I went to the back talking to a brother uh, and his wife. And, you know, they were talking to me and then they prayed for me. They gave me a Bible. And I remember the... We went home and the next day I woke up and something changed. Mm -hmm. Something definitely happened when yeah. I said that prayer and that pastor put his hand on my head and prayed for me. I remember the next morning I'm at work. I got my Bible. I brought my Bible to work and I'm reading it and the Bible was coming to life to me. I'm reading it and I have tried to read the Bible before. Like even when I was in jail, I would open it and read it. I didn't get mm -hmm. nothing out of it. It was like a foreign language. Mm -hmm. But when I opened it up this time, it's like coming alive and it's speaking to me like in real time, real life. I remember at work, I was a guy running like the squares, like gambling. Uh, it was either football. Sometimes we would even do like the boxing, you know, like rounds, uh, betting. Basically, I was involved in gambling at work, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of people look at it like nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, it, 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 gambling in my family is, is not good. Mm. Um my dad's father, which is my grandfather, ended up getting killed in a card game, mm -hmm. gambling, uh, from from what my father tells us. I grew up watching my dad and my uncles gamble up to like four or five in the morning. We're all crying, tired, want to go home, and now they're over there playing poker mm -hmm. all through the middle of the night until the early morning. So gambling was like big, and it was big in my family, but that morning, that next day, like something in me is telling me, man, you have to stop gambling. Mm -hmm. And I remember on my 9.30 break at work, I felt that conviction so heavily that I drove to the ATM, I got some money, I came back, and I handed off the pool to somebody else. I'm like, here, man, I ain't going to be running mm -hmm. these pools no more. I got out of that. And um, yeah, I would say that next day started to, you know, like there was a change, definitely a change. I remember going to church Thursday for the prayer meeting, and, and Sunday was when it really mm -hmm. Really, something drastic changed. It was me, you, and your sister. We went to church, you know, and on the way back, we went to Best Buy, and we bought the movie The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. We went back to our apartment, and we're, we put the movie in. We're watching it. And I remember when the movie ended, I asked you and your sister to, to leave the apartment. And you're like, why? And I told you, just leave. Like, just, you know, just get, get, get out of the apartment. And you guys left. And I remember I grabbed my Bible 
I opened it. And when I opened it, I tried to read it, but I just started crying. Mm -hmm. I just started crying like uncontrollably, like tears were just falling uh, uh, down my face. And after I started crying, I, I just started throwing up. Mm -hmm. I was in the bathroom throwing up for like a good 15 minutes, just nonstop throwing up. Uh, and I remember you guys came back about an hour later and I was all like looking all sickly, pale, and like, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And man, I, I don't know. Like at, at that moment, I like, man, maybe something I ate. But the crazy thing is that that night, we ended up going to a church on the north side Fullerton, by Fullerton and Pulaski. And they were having a play. Mm -hmm. It was called uh, Hell's Flames and Heaven's Gates. It was basically a production company. They travel the country and they go to churches and they do this play, you know, mm -hmm. for people to just go watch it. So we're like, uh, man, I knew I needed to go see that play. So we ended up going. We parked around the corner of the church. It was me, you, I believe it was your sister and our friend mm -hmm. where we, that we live with. And we get to the front of the church and there was a lot, line of people waiting to get in. They were waiting by the doors. They hadn't opened the doors yet. Yeah. And we got to the front and I remember asking you to give me the car keys. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why? I'm like, man, just give me the car keys. <laughs> so I remember you gave me the car keys. I took a step to turn around and I just began to throw up in front yeah. of the church. Mm -hmm. I threw up in front of the church. I left a trail going through the side all the way back to your car. I got to the back seat of your car and I was still throwing up. Mm. And I believe that that whole day from that incident in the morning and that night, that was like God cleansing me. Yeah. Cleansing me of all the wickedness of all whatever pact, I guess, in a sense that I had made with the devil by com confessing, you know, making an allegiance, I guess, with him. Yeah spiritually and it was it was like a deliverance in yeah. that moment yeah. uh so i would say that uh the only way i could the only thing i could compare it to is like there's a story in the bible where jesus went into the temple and he started flipping up t uh flipping over tables and mm -hmm. chasing the people out remember yeah. he made a cord and started yeah like a whip and started chasing people out of the temple and he, he said now this is my father's house yeah you have turned it into a house of, of, of thieves yeah into a den of thieves mm -hmm. so that's the only thing i could compare it to like the bible says that god was going to send the holy spirit into us so i believe what happened on that day when i asked jesus into my heart into my life the heat that i felt that was the holy spirit that filled me mm -hmm. and i believe that that following sunday the Holy Spirit cleaned house. Because mm. the Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So I think that's what made it easy for me to change. That brought about a quick change where I stopped drinking. You know, stopped, you know, I stopped getting high. You know, back then I think I was only smoking weed. But even that, and it was just like overnight. It was just a touch of God, honestly. I know a lot of people would tell me, man, you got good willpower. You got it, man, you're, you know, you're, you're strong. And like, nah, it's not me. Yeah. Trust me. I know it's not me because yeah. I, I know what I like. Yeah. You know, I, I read a book, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole, in it he said something. He said, many a man can change his way, but only God can change his nature. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we could do stuff to try to change, you know. Let's say if I want to stop drinking, I could go you know, join a club like AA you know, or something, but we could change in our own strength and our own will. Yeah, possibly, but only God could change our nature, meaning those things that come naturally to us. Mm -hmm. He has the power to change that, almost like to do a reset. So yeah, I would say that was definitely a work of God. And I don't that, know, what, yeah. do you remember? Like, let's say, for instance, what, what did you think when you see me like throwing up that night? What do you remember about that night? Yeah, that's why... Babe, I think your testimony is my favorite because I know who you were. Like, I lived with you. I knew who you were. Um, I saw that side of you. I saw, you know, I, I saw the darkness. I saw the the lost man. I, I saw the, the, the demon-influenced man, you know. Um, I saw that man. And when the Lord... You know, when the Lord came into your life and you surrendered your life to him, I saw the change. I saw it, it was a radical change. And and I don't know why or how, you know, it happens, but 
it's supernatural. You know, you can't explain something like that. You can't put it into words. But I seen for myself the transformation. I seen you go from darkness to light. I seen your heart change. The man that you were changed. Your nature changed. I saw that. And like you said, you know, a lot of people say, would we'll tell you, man, you have you have strong willpower and that's, that takes discipline. But they don't realize that it, it really, it was God. It was God, God's hand, his Holy Spirit, his grace um, that I believe enabled you and, and, you know, changed your life. You know, I can't contribute this to you because I know you and yeah. I knew you. The only one that I can say would bring about such a change is God. Yeah. And so for me, because I've I've lived this out with you and I've seen it, I give the glory to God. Amen. I the credit to God because this is not something that you know you would have ever invited in, into your life on your own. You know what I mean? You would right. have never invited healing and transformation and you didn't want nothing to do with that you know and it wasn't until you know jesus came into your life that things changed that our lives changed your life changed yeah. um drastically i remember you coming home sometimes and you know you would share the word with me and and that even prompted us months later to to get married because we weren't even married um when, when we got saved yeah can, can i share that part of the story yeah, yeah. <laughs> go so, for it so here we are you know I, I i get i get saved in october 26 2004 it was a tuesday i got saved god's working in me changing me like immediately here i am evangelizing i remember going back to the neighborhood and witnessing to my friends and knocking on their doors and I remember like ru ruining people's highs. Yeah, they'd be out there all high, and I come up to them and start sharing. God, man, God loves them, man. They need to repent. They need to turn their life around. And I just see them from going all happy to eyes all wide, like, man, what's this guy talking about? You know. Yeah. But man, I, like, I had a fire for the things of God, witnessing, evangelizing. Man, just going to church three days a week with you, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, uh, learning, growing, and. Uh, so here we are going to church, you know, and, uh, man, they would, they would preach the word hard. You know, they would, it was the truth, you know, and, uh, I remember they would talk a lot about like fornicating, you know, if you're living together, sleeping together and you're not married, that's fornication, that's sin. And that's what we were doing. You know, mm -hmm. we weren't married. And I remember you, you would tell me like, babe, uh, uh, God wants to bless us, but he can't. And then I'd be like, why not? He's like, cause we're. We're not married. We're living in sin. We're living in sin. I'm like, ah, you know, nah. So you, so here I am being obedient to God and all this, and I just couldn't be obedient and making it right by getting married. Like, I don't know why. I, I never looked at myself as getting married. Uh, you know, I, I know I shared this where growing up, listening to Easy, Too Short, and Snoop Dogg, they never talk about getting married, you know? <laughs> So that those those that was those were my role models, you know. I never looked at you know, getting married. So here we are going to church, and I remember telling you, okay, we'll get married one day. We'll go to city hall, right? And I would always postpone it. I got to work overtime, and we can't, you know. We'll go this week. Oh no, I got to work overtime. We can't. So we kept pushing it and pushing it, and I remember one day I had I had told you it was a Friday night. It was February eighteenth. And I had told you, uh, okay, uh, to, to, uh, tomorrow we'll go get married. Uh, so you fell asleep next to me on the bed. So I'm there, I'm just sitting on the bed and a deep doubt just hit me. Like, do I want to get married? You know, should I get married? So I'm right there like debating, like, I don't want to get married. So I remember I said a prayer. I said, God, give me a sign that you want me to marry this woman. I'm not going to marry her because she's telling me to marry her. I'm not going to marry her because the pastor and the church are saying I should marry her. I even said, I'm not going to marry her just because she's pregnant. I said, I want to do your will and not my will. Like, give me a sign. If you want me to marry this woman, give me a sign that you want me to marry this woman. 
So I remember I'm there and I'm just praying. I have my eyes closed and just one word came to me. I, I didn't hear, hear it um, audibly, <clears throat> excuse me, but the word was, I don't know if it came to my mind or to my heart, however you want to explain it, but just one word, Proverbs. It was just that, Proverbs. So when that word came to me, I remember a pastor saying that whatever day of the of the month it was, read that chapter of Proverbs, because uh, the book of Proverbs consists of 31 chapters, and most months have like 31 days. So, mm -hmm. okay, so I said my prayer, give me a sign. The word comes to me, Proverbs. So I grab my Bible next to me, I open up to the book of Proverbs, and I turn to Proverbs 18, because it was February 18. So I started reading, and I get to Proverbs 18, 22, and it says, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. I remember reading that. I closed my Bible, and the next morning, we went and got married. Yeah. You know, and we went. It was just me and you, no witnesses. City Hall, we were the second couple in line. Yeah. We went in there, got married, and we celebrated by going to Baker Square and having some breakfast. <laughs> And I remember sitting there at Baker Square as we're just eating. And literally, I felt like a weight come off my shoulders. Yes. Like I felt something come off of me. Yes. And after that, that's when God started like blessing us. Like mm -hmm. literally, like just blessing after blessing uh, started coming to us. And I was having a conversation with a brother recently that there's blessing and obedience. Mm. You know, a lot of times God, you know, bless me, you know, God make this happen, but we want to disobey what he calls us to do. Uh, we want to do things our way. Yeah. You know, and back then uh, I wanted to, you know, continue living how I was without getting married. But I was like, you mentioned it's sin. Yeah. You know, there's no way to, oh, times have changed. No, maybe times have changed, but his word doesn't change. That's right. And yeah. if we want God's blessing, we, got, we got to walk in obedience and do those things that he calls us to do. So I believe that he he blessed that, he honored that, and man, we've been married 17 years now. We got married on uh, February 19, 2005. Mm. So it's been a blessing. It's Honestly, that's one of the best things I've ever done because you've truly been a blessing in my life. Uh, a lot of the stuff that, that I've been able to accomplish has been... A lot of times through your prayer or just words of wisdom that God gives you for us, for our marriage and for me. And it's, you know, it's, we have, we, we've had our ups and downs, right? It mm -hmm. hasn't been, be you know, just all beautiful, you know, it's, yeah. there's been some struggles in there. But yes. one thing that has kept our marriage strong is that God's been in the center of it, yeah. of our family. So, yeah, definitely, man, God's been good. There's so much we could say, but yeah. Yeah. And I think to add to that is His grace, babe. I think that His grace has is, is everything. His grace covers us through and through. It's covered us through, you know, the, our struggles, our, our, our season when we struggled with communicating with one another, which really affected our marriage in so many ways. And we didn't even know what the problems were that we were having, but a lot of it had to do um with communication and we even um you know took a class and and received um fusion marriage counseling um for those areas of our struggles you know i think one thing that it's is important to mention is um the investments that we've made into our marriage um we we've, we've taken marriage classes um, count, marriage counseling. Um, we've invested in going to marriage retreats. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that God um, is blessing us because you know of the things that we do. God's grace is unmerited favor. It's not because of works. It's not because of what we do. But I do believe that faith and love for your spouse wanting to invest in your marriage, that all aligns up with God's will for our lives, with him being at, in the center of it, with him um, leading us and, and, and guiding us. I do believe that it is important to invest in our marriage and it's worth yes. it. It's worth every, every bit of time, um, 
and and even monetary investments that we've had to make um our date nights you know setting aside that time for one another um our time of fellowship with each other and with the lord you know the times that we've gotten in prayer together um just all that uh leads to a healthy strong marriage in the lord and yeah. And like you said, you know, I know you've mentioned I've been a blessing to you. You've been a blessing to me. You've been a blessing to me um, because you you are a man who who loves God. You are a man who is honest, a man of little words, but more action. Um, and that has always been to me like you've been a model for me and, and our children um, to, to be a doer, you know, to be a doer and of the word, like, like, don't just hear the word, but actually put it to action and do it. And, um, you've set that example for us and I'm really grateful to the Lord for you. And, um, I can't wait to see what the Lord continues to have for you and, um, for our family. Because when I say that, I don't say it lightly because I know, blessings come but i also know fiery darts come along with that too and so i don't i don't just throw that out there lightly and um but i know we trust in the lord and we trust in him so mm -hmm. um i know that you usually finish off your uh, wrong to strong episodes with asking your guests you know what are some words of what what's some words or advice that you would give to someone who's maybe gone is going through through what you're you went through, what would some words of advice or encouragement be for that person? No, I, I would say not to. Um, a lot of times we complain about the stuff we went through, uh, some of the bad stuff that's happened in my life. Um, one thing I want to share before we end, I know I mentioned back then when my cousin got killed, just my hatred for the police, right? Mm -hmm. The way I felt, and God changed my heart towards that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I felt back then at that point. But, um, now, you know, I also got family. I got cousins that are police officers. Mm -hmm. I got uh, cousins, they're firemen, family that are all, the, you know, family in the military. So, basically, what's changed, God's changed my heart. I believe he's brought healing in that area uh, to realize that, man, um, well, police officers are human. They have a, you know, a, a tough, a tough job to do, and honestly, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I admire people that run towards the gunfire, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. You know, co cops have a tough job to do. You know, they 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 go to where people are running from, where there's danger. Instead of running away from it, they go towards it, and they're you know the majority of them are there to serve and protect. Mm. You know, I know recently they got in a lot of, you know, bad press and the way I look at it is there's sin no matter what field you're in. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you're always going to have your, like they say, bad apples, whether it be in uh, police or anywhere. You, you could even have it, let's say, in pastors. All you see in the, in, in the news is, let's say, the ones that are bad. They never show you the ones that are doing good, right? Mm -hmm. Serving God faithfully. And so there's sin no matter what field you're in. And yeah, God, God definitely brought a different perspective, a change of heart to me. And uh, now that I'm a law-abiding citizen, you know, I don't I don't look at the police that way. Mm -hmm. Quote, quote, unquote, uh, law-abiding <laughs> citizen. But yeah, I just wanted to share that, just to clarify that. Um, and yeah, to anybody out there, um, like some of the bad stuff that happens, I think it believes shapes us and molds us into what God wants us to be, even the bad. Like, like um, right before I got locked up, I was very bad. And I was I was doing everything. I was smoking weed. I was drinking. I was doing acid. We used to roll joints, put cocaine in them, and dip them in PCP and smoke it. That's like, you got to be like, just out there bad, just trying to experiment and try a new high with. Mm -hmm. Straight up all type of craziness, all in one smoke. Uh, so I was out there bad. So when I got locked up, for the three years when I got out, the only stuff that I touched was drinking and smoking weed. I never touched PCP, cocaine, acid, and all these other stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Looking back, like, man, 
almost like God saved me from myself. Mm -hmm. Like by me being in jail, it saved me from getting in, it probably into some deeper mess. Mm -hmm. By me spending three years in jail, it saved me from maybe getting killed or getting some more time than some other, you know, uh, thing that I possibly c could have done. Because yeah. while, while I was in there, I had a, I know a good friend of mine passed away and there were just a lot of violence in the neighborhood. You know, and a lot of the guys were, man, you just hear about just bad stuff happening, you know, mm -hmm. as I'm in there. So I believe it was almost like God pr protecting me. Yeah. You know, I, I met a, a lot of good people in there that I'm friends with today. Uh, friends that have reconnected, friends that have come to the Lord recently. Mm -hmm. You know, and these guys, now we're doing Bible studies together. Here we are in jail, uh, lifting weights together, mm -hmm. playing handball, basketball. And now God's grabbed a hold of them, yeah. bringing chains to their life. So I believe everything happens for a reason. God has a purpose to even our madness. So to anybody out there in that lifestyle, you know, um, if you feel lost, you feel like there's no future for you. You feel like, man, it's better if I'm dead. It's better, man, if, if, if I'm taken out. I, I didn't share this, but I remember as a teenager, I never wanted to have kids. Hmm. Even in my early twenties, I didn't want to be a father. I look, at, I looked at myself like cursed. Hmm. Like I felt like, man, it's better if I die and I don't have no seed left behind. Hmm. And I know that was a lie of the enemy, because the enemy wanted to finish me off, and he wanted to finish off those kids that were gonna be a blessing. So now when I see, you know, uh, I know Angel, you know, he's, he's my stepson. You know, when I met you, he was one year old, but then Angelina came, Moses. And I see the blessings that they are. And the enemy wanted to take me out and basically them, right? So, yeah, don't don't let the enemy lie to you that there's no hope or a future for you. Mm -hmm. You know, he's trying to deceive you because he doesn't want you to surrender your life to, to God. You know, God created you for, for a purpose. You're, you're on earth for a purpose. You're, you're not an accident. Mm -hmm. You're not a product of evolution. You didn't come out from some bacteria. Like, there's nobody else like you on this earth. And my advice to you is, is if you're in darkness, so come to the light, you know, turn to Jesus and repent. That's the first thing Jesus tells us to do is to repent, you know, to turn away, uh, to seek him. You know, ask Jesus uh, to be Lord and Savior of your life. Uh, I know I had a, a, a brother of ours, uh, a JC, recently when, when he got saved, he said that he fell to his knees and he just started confessing everything that he did. He was by himself. You know, there wasn't no priest there, nobody else. He just fell on his knees and started confessing. He said all this stuff started coming to his mind. And he just started confessing and, and asking God to forgive him. Uh, maybe you need to get to that point. You know, get down on your knees. And man, just start confessing everything you've done and ask God to forgive you. Ask him to, to heal you, to help you, and to be Lord and Savior of your life. And and just uh, make room for him. You know, you've, you've tried the street life. You you tried all this other stuff. You try to find your satisfaction with women and drugs. And maybe it satisfies you for a minute, but you still have that void. They call it that God-sized void in your heart. Um, that could only be filled by him. And you have to allow room for him to come into your heart. Uh, so my advice to, to anyone listening that is in a similar situation is, man, come, come to God through Jesus Christ. And, and, and then see what he could do for you. Amen. Thank you so much, um, babe, for allowing me to interview you. Um, this has been just a, a great opportunity, again, to kind of relive some of those areas of our yes. lives, you know, to kind of go back and remember, remember what God has done and remember that he's still moving. He's still working in us inside of us in our hearts and through us yeah. um and so i'll hand this off to you so you can end your show your yeah, podcast well, yeah there, there's basically this is just i know we're an hour and 30 minutes into this uh -huh. and we haven't even shared i don't even think a portion of what god's done for us and yeah. through us i mean there's so many stories testimonies that we could share with people maybe we'll do that one testimony at a time yeah but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, God's been good to us, merciful and kind. He's, uh, he doesn't, you know, he, he, he blesses us. He blesses us even when we don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, it's by, like you mentioned, it's just mercy. It's, it's, it's just it's grace. grace. Yeah. Like an unmerited favor, undeserved. Like, well, you know, we don't, we don't do good like to get the blessings but because of his blessing it makes us do good yeah. like it's a response to his love yes. it's a response to who he is um that's that's where this this obedience comes from is a, is in response to who god is what he's done his love for us um his forgiveness for us it's it's grace it's unmerited favor we we can't explain it you know it's not something that we can explain um but it's it's all god's doing and one of the things that i just need to say is that this christian walk this this walk this journey that we have it's not an easy one that's the bible calls it a narrow path so along with the blessings trust me there have been seasons in our lives where um, what the Bible calls the spiritual battle, um, where we've had to armor up, where we've had to literally um, put on our armor and and fight the good fight of faith and grab the sword, which is the word of God, grab our shield, which is, um, you know, the, the shield of faith that extinguishes the fiery darts of the evil one. Um, just because you choose to follow Christ, um, that doesn't mean that you're not going to see days where the enemy does, you know, comes in like a, like a storm and, and he's coming at not just you, but your family, your children, the ones that you love. And you, you have to stand in faith and you have to trust in the Lord and know that he goes before you and know that at times it's, it's not your battle to fight, but it's his and he's asking you to show up. And so this walk is not an easy walk, but this walk is worth it. Yes. It's worth it because of what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, we live a life in response to what Jesus Christ already accomplished, mm -hmm. already finished, already completed at the cross. And so I, I needed to share that because I, I don't want anyone to ever come under the impression that okay i give my life to christ yes the transformation happens but after that i'm good and you know life's gonna be smooth and happy and no friends this this is definitely um this is not for the the weak hearted this is for this walk is a walk of um, picking up our cross and following jesus and so um again going back to the question um what would you say? Did you did you already share what you would say? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you we, did. We, we, okay. We already shared that. <laughs> okay. I get a I get a little sidetrack. Uh, yeah, a that's little all right. <laughs> no, but yeah, no. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great uh, clarification. We're not, uh, you know, saying come to God and everything's gonna be dandy. But now, when you do face storms and trials in life, you know God is with you. God yes. is right by your side. You're not alone. And 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 if you look back on your life, He's been by your side. Yes. If you're alive, you know, he's been by your side. Yeah. If you know there was times where you should have been taken out, but you're still here, you got breath in your lungs, God's been by your side. The Bible says that God is patient with us, yes. not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Mm. And there's a reason he's been merciful to you. He's allowing time for you to come to him, to repent, you know, to 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 ask him to forgive you and, and to make him Lord and Savior of your life. So. There's a purpose for you. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, we're, you know, we're going to close it out now. Uh, I want to thank my wife for joining us. And usually I'll end with my uh, theme music. But today I'm going to end it with something a little different. It's actually, I don't know if you can hear that. That's my wife's theme music. So what I want to share is that um, I don't know when I'm going to release this podcast. But on Sunday, what date is that? The 23rd? Yeah, October 23rd. October 23rd. Uh, my wife is going to be releasing her her own podcast, and uh, that is called "Her Scars Tell a Story." So, I want to just encourage everybody to go look for that podcast. You know, sign, uh, subscribe to it, make sure you like it, and I, I'm gonna let my wife describe what that's going to be about. So, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, this is a platform for women 
from different backgrounds, different cultures, um, to have the opportunity to share their story. I have the, had the privilege and the honor to sit across from women um, during my years in women's ministry, which has been about 17 years that I've been involved at, at some level in women's ministry, serving women. Um, and I've had the opportunity to listen to their stories. I've had the opportunity to look into their eyes as they share, you know, some of the things that they've been through. And a lot of these women are just ordinary women, just like myself, women who may never have the opportunity to get on a stage or to, to get, uh, you, you know, to, to, to be exposed. Um, but I, I would like to, you know, partner up with the Lord and provide this platform for women to share their story, to share their scars, to share of the redeeming love and power of God in and through their lives. So this platform is for all women, all women to just come and be a part of a community that is a safe place that encourages women, that champions women, that will just support a woman and her mission and whatever the Lord would put on her heart to share. Um, that's what this platform is for. So again, the name of this podcast is Her Scars Tell a Story, launching October 23rd at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. Amen, amen, man. I'm just, I'm, I'm excited. I know God's gonna use that to, to be a blessing, you know, to you and to these women and to anybody else who hears these stories of healing. I know I've got a chance to get a, you know, glimpse into where, you, where you're getting to release. And man, some of these stories are deep, uh, some deep uh, testimonies. And uh, man, what God's done, what God's been able to do and heal. And man, her scars tell a story. So make sure you guys. You know, join, you know, on Facebook Live. You could like her uh, Facebook page. On Instagram, you're under Her Scars Tell a Story. Yes. That, that's the the handle. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so with that, you know, we're going to get ready to close this out. I want to thank my beautiful wife for uh, basically interviewing me today. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a, and a joy going down my memory lane with you. Uh, so once again, this is uh, Wrong to Strong Chicago. Uh, my name is Omar Calvillo, and I am Wrong to Strong. Matthew 4.16 reads, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. I will be your host. My name is Omar Calvillo, and I am Wrong to Strong. Wrong to Strong.